Good morning. That was great. Oh, boy, I had one cup of coffee so far, but we're going to make this happen. Sound good? Here we go. This is your last flick study guide for the final exam. And then you'll be in eighth grade. <laughs> it's harder in eighth grade. There's a lot more writing, too. I can't wait. Hold on one second. All right. Briefly explain the Industrial Revolution. Well, we know the Industrial Revolution was a second of our third revolutions in the unit. Remember the 2012 uh, London Olympic closing uh, opening ceremonies? Yeah, with the smokestacks in the factories. That was fun. The Industrial Revolution began in Europe, mainly in Great Britain. New forms of energy were produced. People are starting to discover and create new fuels. And these forms of energy, coal, um, are now able to create these things called factories. Now goods are made in one building. So things are brought, raw materials are brought to a building. They are manufactured, factory, get it? They are manufactured in one building. And then that way the process of making the good is easier, faster, and cheaper. People now go to work in factories, which meant people did not make goods at home. Goods are now mass produced, which means they become cheaper. And more factories means more workers. More workers means more people got new and different jobs, which means they made money, which means they could spend that money on stuff. New forms, of, yeah, see, there you go. Ra we also see the building of railroads, canals, machines that are created to do the work. The steam engine, that's a big one, okay? Uh, globalization, that was one of our fun units. It's the transfer of ideas and goods around the world. So it's not just shipping stuff to China and China shipping stuff to Korea, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, boy, I really am not awake yet. I apologize. It's the transfer of ideas and goods around the world. Remember Brain Drain, how people are moving to countries where they can get a better education and then they stay there because they can get a better job? That means that that country doesn't get that academic and employment opportunity because these people leave to go to other countries. We got a lot of pros and cons of globalization. I'm just going to straight up read it. Globalization allows goods to be cheaper because they can be made in countries where the minimum wage is lower. The cost of shipping goods is also lower because they end up they end up on those massive ships and it's really not expensive to put a bunch of goods in a shipping container. Goods and ideas are spread all over the world because trade is so much easier. Also, culture spread as ideas are spread. The way people live their lives, cultural beliefs and cultural differences and cultural ideas, those also start to move. Over a billion people have been lifted out of poverty because they get new jobs. These are mainly in third world and developing world countries, but they now have jobs, they are able to pay, and they can have better living conditions. Unfortunately, uh, 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 sorry. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes the workers do not necessarily live in great working conditions. They have rough daily lives, some of them in sweatshop labor. Some of them, you know, they, they have it rough. Some nations also pollute more because they waste more goods. So China and the United States and India are massive nations that pollute, and this is because of globalization. They make so many goods for the world, and those goods are transferred around the world. Therefore, there is more pollution. And also, they waste more natural resources because they believe they have a plethora of it. And then, sometimes ideas and goods leave the homeland to go to other countries. We saw that. And uh, Starbucks. Remember, Starbucks globalized. Starbucks globalization goes to other countries and sometimes put smaller businesses and local businesses out of work. You know, Starbucks goes into a town and there's a local coffee shop and because they're a bunch of crazy, they, they destroy the local coffee shop. We're almost done. The Great Leap Forward in China. Um, Mao Zedong wanted China to enter a massive age of collective farming and industry. Collectivism, which is communism, which means everyone gets together for a common goal working together. Uh, Mao Zedong wanted farmers and peasants, pe peasants, pres oh my gosh, peasants, sorry, to create steel mills in their yards. 
they, I mean, they're melting bicycles and basic metals to try to create steel to make China a more industrial nation. And then they had some people who were living in these massive farms. And it was a tremendous failure because people didn't really know how to make steel. There were less farmers working the land. There was drought. More than 20 million people died from famine and because they were unable to make a living. So it was not a great leap forward. It was a great leap backward. Now, the pro and con of the one-child policy in China. Remember, this is good because it controls the population, prevents overpopulation. However, there's not always enough people to work. Oh, boy. I'm a lot more tired in this video than previous videos. I'm sorry. Sometimes there are not enough people to work. And so because of that, the, pro the um, ability to... Uh, produce goods is lower, so therefore the country cannot thrive. Also, if a child dies in their early years, the family may lose that one child and they may not be able to have another child. It's also hard for aging parents and grandparents to be cared for by their children. Remember that in China, it's very customary that uh, children children take care of, grand of grandparents and their parents as they get older because it's a way of they were reared when they were young, and so now it is up to them to take care of their families when they age. Uh, Juche, which is a uh, North Korean idea of self-reliance, it, it, they believe that they can do everything on their own. They want, they, they, North Korea believes that they are not reliant on other nations for goods, that they can do everything within North Korea. However... It is unrealistic. 85% of all the goods they have come from China. They hardly produce anything. They don't have really anything that's exportable to any other countries. So the idea of Juche, that they're not self-reliant. They do what they do independently, and they believe that is self-reliance, but it's really not self-reliance. It's having to, to rely on other people, but that not the Western world, not people like Europe and the United States. Last question. I didn't type an answer. Sorry about that. What did it mean that World War I soldiers rode in on horses and left in airplanes? This is one of our favorite ones. Remember we had a great discussion about this? One of the big things is that the technology entering World War I was still very primitive. It was still very basic. And so, yeah, they rode in on horses. They had guns that could only fire one or two bullets at a time. Then the technology became unparalleled to anything else in human history. The invention of the tank, practically indestructible. Uh, the invention of chlorine and mustard gas, which killed millions. You have um, long-range cannons that can fire up to nine miles. And then really the air, uh, submarines too, underwater warfare. And my personal favorite is the airplane, because now war is three-dimensional. No longer is war fought just by land and by sea. It is now fought by land, air, and sea. So they entered on horses, which was basic and primitive, and they left in airplanes a brand new technology. There are your study guides for the final exam. It's multiple choice, it's 80 questions, and you're gonna have to do a lot of reading and then determining what is correct and incorrect for the final. Hope you enjoyed it, be good.